Thank you for joining us today. I'm Dr. Kiki Sanford of the This Week in Science podcast. I'm joined by the Honorable Jane Lubchenco. She is a distinguished professor at the University of Oregon in Oregon State Oregon University. State. Oh gosh, <laughs> ducks versus <laughs> beavers. Beavers, yes. <laughs> I have to remember to get these things straight. These are the important things. Yes, um, this afternoon you gave a topical lecture here at the annual AAAS meeting called Seize the Day, Science Driving Ocean and Climate Solutions. And aside from having a punny title, um, it, I was struck by the uh, importance of addressing the General Congress of AAAS with a message of hope and a message of solutions. And is this something that has changed in the years that you have been working in your field? I really believe that uh, it, scientists, especially environmental scientists, anybody who's paying attention to climate change or other ways in which the environment is changing, uh, are so aware of the magnitude of the challenges, uh, the inertia in the system, the difficulties of changing to more sustainable practices and policies that it's really easy for us all to focus on the urgency message, which scientists have done quite well. And make no mistake, things are very, very urgent. But I think without uh, a coupled message of urgency and hope, it is all too easy for people to just tune out and think, I can't do anything, this isn't solvable, why should I pay any attention to it? And in fact, that's the opposite of what we need. We need all hands on deck. We need everybody engaged. And so for that to happen, I think there needs to be two parallel, mutually reinforcing messages of urgency and hope. That hope can't be false hope, though. It has to be grounded in reality. And I am hopeful because I have seen so many amazing things that are happening around the planet that are indeed hopeful. There is reason to be optimistic, cautiously so. It's not, most of those things are not at the scale that's needed, they're not at the pace that's needed, but if we shine a spotlight on them, they can serve as models to emulate they can inspire similar action elsewhere. They can drive new solutions. And I think that invitation to people to help be part of the solution does indeed depend on hope as well as urgency. Your career has been an example of, um, of employing the social contract of being a scientist, not just doing the science, but also interacting with society and trying to make change. And that was one of the points in the first part of your talk. How do you feel, I want to hear it very honestly, about the social contract and the role of scientists today? I think that scientists are just incredibly lucky in being able to uh, indulge our passions for discovery. Uh, and that's what drives many of us. Uh, in exchange for public funding, I think we also have an obligation to give back. And that give back is not only discovering new knowledge, but sharing it much more widely than has often been done in the past. All too often, new scientific discoveries are published in the scientific literature, and they don't really make it into the halls of Congress or into the kitchens of people uh, in their homes uh, or the boardrooms. Uh, and they need to be in all of those places. For that to happen, the science needs to be understandable, it needs to be accessible, it needs to be relevant and usable and credible. And that's a huge opportunity for scientists to not only do the discovery, but then make it accessible and understandable and relevant. We've seen a huge shift in the appetite of the scientific community 
to actually engage in scientific communication. That's happening so much more than when I was a graduate student or a young assistant professor. Uh, and we now have a lot more knowledge about how to do scientific communication effectively. We have organizations like Compass, whose 20th anniversary we're celebrating. Uh, the Leopold Congratulations Leadership. on that. It's exciting. The Leopold Leadership Program, uh, the Alan Alda uh, Communications Program, AAAS has a program. So there are a lot of programs that we have. Science Talk. <coughs> Science Talk. Absolutely. Absolutely. There are lots of different opportunities for scientists to learn how to communicate better and then engage in conversation. So we've made huge progress in doing that. We've made, so that's part of the social contract, is sharing knowledge. The other part of the social contract is also paying attention to the needs of society in focusing on the research problems that we choose to work on. And a lot of times, scientists shy away from the really gnarly problems because they're just too hard. Or they don't have, just having a scientist work on it isn't enough. And so there has been also, in parallel to the focus on more communication, there's been more and more of an appetite on the part of scientists to tackle really hard problems, to try to be more helpful to society, come up with solutions that can help us live in a way that is more sustainable, for example. Yeah, it's a time to focus on more solutions-based science. And you gave some examples of some of the, those areas of science in your talk. Can you summarize them a bit for our audience here? Sure, sure. So I highlighted three areas in the ocean because I'm a marine ecologist, so, uh, and these are areas that I know well. Uh, the first is, where we've learned a lot more about not only the role of the ocean in the climate system, not only how climate change is impacting the ocean, which is uh, in pretty serious, severe ways, but also the potential the ocean holds for helping to reduce carbon emissions, to mitigate climate change. Now, when most people think about mitigation, they think about buildings, making buildings greener, or transportation systems greener, or planting trees. And in fact, those are really important, but the ocean has been out of sight, out of mind. Recently, uh, I helped facilitate uh, a new report from a group of experts around the world who were really asking the question, how much potential is there from ocean-based activities to reduce carbon emissions? What is the role of the ocean in getting us to uh, achieve the 1.5 degree target of the Paris Agreement by 2050? So, you know, tall order, really important to do it. Does the ocean have a role? And people had not really answered that question. So scientists tackled that problem, crunched the numbers, and came up with some pretty surprising findings, specifically that you could achieve as much as 21% of the carbon emission reductions that are needed to get us to 1.5 by 2050. That's huge. That's one fifth of what we need and it wasn't even on the table. Yeah, no So one that's was a reason it, to be yeah. hopeful. No yes. one was looking at it. So now that we know that, we can focus on the importance of renewable energy from the ocean, so wind and wave, number one. Number two, decarbonizing the shipping industry, making it greener, Number three, focus on blue carbon ecosystems, jargon term, blue carbon ecosystems. These are the salt marshes, the mangroves, and the seagrass beds that are at the coastal margins that are just sucking up carbon like crazy. Yeah, the mangrove but swamps. That the are, mangrove swamps yeah. that people have thought were just, you know, useless unless yeah. they were converted to something else. Well, turns out they do a lot for us and we're losing them at a frantic pace. A massive pace. rate, yeah, yes. It's, it's and so if we would shocking. protect and restore those blue carbon ecosystems, that actually contributes quite significantly to the total reductions that are needed. One of the biggest surprising ones was the potential for reducing carbon emissions from shifting people's diets. 
moving away from animal protein on land to seafood. Much, much lower carbon footprint as well as land print fo footprint and water footprint. Uh, that gets a lot. So those four areas can contribute a lot and are pretty much ready to go, not that they're easy. The fifth one that was included in these calculations focused on sequestering carbon in the seabed. That's one which has huge potential, but a lot of question marks around it. Right, how exactly do we go about doing that when our coral reefs are yep. imperiled and we have mining operations undersea? And so this is not how do we directly this? related to either corals or mining, but is uh, focused on taking CO2 from factories that are near the shore and then burying it uh, in the seabed, not on coral reefs, mind you, right. but the questions around it would be, uh, how do we make sure it's gonna stay there? And are there environmental impacts that we're not aware of? And so there needs to be, this is an area of highlight for R&D, because the potential for emission reductions is huge. So again, those five areas uh, are an example of the ocean, not just as a victim of climate change, but a very powerful source of solutions to climate change. And that's just on the mitigation front. The ocean is also incredibly important from the standpoint of adaptation to climate change that is already underway. The really cool thing is that a lot of those um, switches to mitigate climate change could also bring co-benefits. And so in restoring those stinky mangroves, <laughs> you actually are providing really important habitat for nursery uh, species, economically important. You are uh, providing protection against storm surge and tsunamis for populations that live upstream of, of mangroves. So Which lots is going of co-benefits. Be more important as, as sea levels rise and Absolutely. there's more higher storm surges going further inland. These and bigger are, storms. And bigger storms is going to be mm -hmm. more and more important. Exactly. And were you saying during your talk that this is through the um, MVPs or the, uh, the pr these protected areas, marine protected mm -hmm. areas, MBA, MPA. 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 MPA stands for Marine Protected, protected Area. area. Mm -hmm. It's also a VIP. No. <laughs> Very importantly protected. <laughs> yes, it is. These MPAs are VIPs. Yes. <laughs> so they indeed are uh, a, a, a very powerful but un underutilized tool. Right. Uh, <clears throat> there are lots of different kinds of MPAs. The ones that we're talking about here are ones that are fully protected against any extractive or destructive activities. So no fishing, no mining, no drilling, no extraction allowed, no dumping. So that's what a fully protected MPA is. Yeah. And those areas, we know from a wealth of scientific studies, bring lots of benefits. Uh, when uh, you put in uh, an MPA that's fully protected, you get a profusion of uh, biodiversity that is recovered. So more species, larger individual sizes, more abundant. Uh, not surprisingly, when you stop extracting things, things recover. Things, yeah. <laughs> they, they, <laughs> they get, they get better. better. And in some <laughs> places, it happens relatively quickly. So this is yet another reason to be hopeful. The ocean is resilient if we give it a chance. The challenge is that despite the fact that there are probably 8% of the global ocean is in some kind of MPAs, only 2.4% of it is in these fully, fully protected, protected MPAs. Right. Now the countries of the world have agreed to try to protect 10% of the ocean by this year. We're not quite on track to do that, but there is now renewed discussion about the importance of looking ahead to 2030 and setting a new target, and there will be big international meetings this year coming up to do that. And there's a lot of momentum around the importance of protecting at least 30% of the ocean by 2030 in these fully or at least highly protected areas. And the science tells us that that will not only protect biodiversity, but can also recover depleted fisheries, 
because when you get the bounty increasing inside the protected area, it can spill out to adjacent areas and help recover those fisheries. Yep. And there's an, an additional carbon benefit because there are lots of stores of carbon on the seabed. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't trawl it, you don't mine it, you're protecting it from any extractive activities, then you're protecting those stores of carbon instead of releasing that carbon into the atmosphere. So right. triple bottom line win from Sounds MPAs. Sounds like win, win, win mm -hmm. across the board. Let's mm -hmm. get more of them. Yes. Yes. So speaking of the fish that spill out and can maybe help repair some of the depleted fisheries that are you know, have been in trouble for years, another aspect, uh, an example that you brought up in your talk was the group of CEOs who work for, who run the 10 of the biggest seafood companies in the world who have started talking to scientists. And now I think this is one of the big questions is, okay, let's have the these protected areas, let's protect the fish, but then what happens when the fishermen go out and fish all the fish again? How do we keep that from happening? Is the, is the conversation, the communication that's happening between these business people and the scientists actually starting to have an impact? Is, that, is it going to change things? This is one of the really exciting things that's happening now. Um, if you simply have knowledge that isn't used, mm -hmm. that actually doesn't serve the purpose, right? right. Uh, but scientists aren't typically in a position to be making the key decisions about fishing, for example. Fishery managers might, they might be scientists there, but industry has a key role to play here. And this new organization is called CBOS, which is an acronym. It stands for Seafood Businesses for Ocean Stewardship. And it's a really exciting new partnership between the CEOs of 10 of the largest seafood companies, so they both do wild capture fisheries and aquaculture, and scientists led by the Stockholm Resilience Center. And these CEOs are very respectful of science. They wanted to know how they can help ensure they have a future, and they see all the things going in the wrong direction. They see climate change affecting their fisheries. They see overfishing being a serious problem, illegal fishing being a serious problem. Uh, and they decided that they wanted to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. And Being part of the solution is going to be beneficial to their bottom line. Absolutely. In the long term, <laughs> In the long it run. will. But it also means changing what they do. And that yeah. discussion is underway, and it's fascinating to watch it play out because these CEOs are now talking to one another about the importance of traceability, transparency, accountability, and instead of trying to outdo one another, they see it's actually useful to work together towards some of these good outcomes that are going to bring benefit to all of them. So those areas, uh, so that um, people who buy seafood can know whether it was caught in a sustainable way or not is really important. Uh, they are also really focused on trying to minimize the impact of climate change on fisheries, which is, has potential to be huge. And yeah. if we manage our fisheries better, they will be more resilient to climate change. So it's an exciting dialogue, and scientists are right in there with the CEOs. It's a, it's a novel kind of partnership. That we hope there will be more and more of, because if industry, if business is not in communication with the researchers, the people who are doing the problem solving, then there will continue to be more and more problems as opposed to sustainable solutions. Exactly, yeah. yep. And as, as we get into the last few minutes of our conversation here, I think this also ties into the infrastructure, the systemic issues in academia that you also touched on, where there needs to be support for this kind of partnership. There needs to be a model within academia that allows scientists to reach outside of their institutions in an effort to make external impacts on the world. Can you talk a little bit about some of the, the changes that you think need to take place? Yeah, this is really uh, a fascinating discussion that's underway now. Um, the academic institutions, I think, by and large, have done a spectacular job of creating the environment in which scientists can discover new knowledge. They've been uh, 
also uh, focused on sharing that knowledge with the next generation of scientists and educating citizens. They haven't really paid much attention to the opportunities for academic scientists to partner in transparent ways with NGOs, uh, with uh, governments, with uh, CEOs, like this uh, the CBOS, CBOS yeah. example that we just talked about. Um, and, and there are real serious impediments within academia for doing all of that. And one of them is simply the culture of academia that values the production of knowledge as seen through grants and publications. It does not value scientists engaging in society, meeting with communities, meeting, sharing knowledge, interacting, giving science talks, interacting with NGOs, with CEOs. That's, it, nobody objects to that, but it takes time to do that well and it takes training to do it well. And sometimes, for certain efforts, it takes funding. And it takes funding, and that's what's missing. And so the culture of academia actually inhibits scientists doing engagement and outreach. Uh, and the, f the amazing progress that we've seen in the last two decades of scientists doing those things have been individual scientists that do it despite the system because they are committed, they are convinced it's important. And now we have gotten to a point where individual action is not enough. We need collective action to change the culture of academia to make it more, to make it easier and, and rewarded to be doing this kind of social engagement and problem solving that I think is really needed for us to tackle these big, gnarly problems that are really, really urgent, but for which there's hope. There is hope. There's urgency, there's hope, and hopefully there is the will to make these changes that need to take place. Do you have a take-home message that you would love AAAS members, scientists who may come across this video chat later, what one thing do you want scientists to take home with them into their everyday lives? I think what individuals do matters hugely. Uh, that's what changes things. And individuals have shown huge changes are possible. Now is the time for individuals to work together so that collectively we can have the greater impact that is needed that will benefit both people and the planet. Thank you very much. I appreciate My your pleasure. time today. Thank Thanks. you.